background. Our next speaker. Linda Moulton Howe is a graduate of Stanford University with a master's degree in communication. She's devoted her film and television career to documentary and studio productions concerning science, medicine, and the environment. Ms. Howe has received local, national, and international awards, including three regional Emmys and a national Emmy nomination for her documentaries. Those films have included Fire in the Water about hydrogen as an alternative energy source to fossil fuels, a radioactive water investigated uranium contamination of public drinking water in Denver. A strange harvest, of course, explored the worldwide animal mutilation mystery which has haunted the US and other countries since the late 1960s and continues to date. In 1989, she authored and published a hardcover book entitled An Alien Harvest. She was also director of international programming for Earthbeat, an environmental series broadcast on Turner's WTBS superstation, Atlanta, Georgia. Her television productions in 1990 included the creation of a two-hour special, Earth Mysteries, Alien Life Forms, in association with WATL Fox, Atlanta, and a documentary, The Pressure of Fact, about international child survival efforts for UNICEF in New York. In 1991, she was contracted with Paramount Studios as supervising producer and original concept creator for an hour special based on her Earth Mysteries program. And that hour, UFO Report Sightings, was broadcast on October the 18th, 1991, and January the 25th, 1992, and led to the sighting series on the Fox Network. In 1992, Linda was voted the International MUFON Award, honoring her contributions to advancing understanding of the complex alien life form phenomena. She helped coordinate 1992 scientific investigation of the crop circle mystery in England, and has distributed a documentary investigation, Crop Circle Communique, in association with Circle Vision England. Linda continues to write, produce, and speak at national and international conferences and symposiums, including NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and to produce reports for television and radio, including news for the nationally syndicated radio program, Dreamland. She has been interviewed on The Other Side, NBC, Larry King Live Special, Montel Williams TV Show, and other national and international media. Her new book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1, Facts and Eyewitnesses, was released in March 1994, and a new documentary investigation, Strange Harvest, 1993, was released in July 1994. In January 1995, she joined the Electronic University Faculty of America's Online Institute for the Study of Contact with Non-Human Intelligence, ISCNI. In late 1995, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness, will be released. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, my pleasure to introduce Miss Linda Moulton Howe. First, let's check and make sure that sound is working. It sounds like that it is. We had the problem of having to change a United States slide tray over to an English slide tray, and that's what we have been doing madly backstage. One thing I'd like to do is to pick up with where Graham was talking about this whole issue of how much could be truth, how much disinformation, and how intelligence offices have for decades refined the technique of being able to bury real material inside of disinformation or material that they think will buy more time in this policy of silence that our government in the United States at least, and I think the English government, has put on this whole subject of contact with another intelligence. And to that end, before I go into my formal presentations, I would like to share with you some of the contradictory and confusing statements that have come to me just over the last four months, beginning approximately three months ago on email 
I received an email that said, I owe you one. The writer was supposed to be one of the people that I crossed paths with back in 83 to 84 when I was working on that HBO project and had uh, all of those various encounters at Kirtland Air Force Base and with others describing also crash disks and retrievals of alien beings alive or dead. And in this email approximately three months ago, it said, I want to caution you on the Ray Santilli alleged Roswell footage. It is my understanding, even though I cannot prove, that this was a production by the Central Intelligence Agency in Brazil in the early 1970s as a backup to deflect Soviet interest in what the United States government had on retrieved craft and aliens and beings. The plot gets thicker every time we turn around because if the government of the United States has been, been in fact creating hoaxed autopsy footage in other countries in order to slip it to the Soviet Union, the levels of disinformation and the Machiavellian labyrinth of intelligence and counterintelligence that now surrounds this field is becoming mind-boggling. But at the core of it is what I'm going to try to describe today are the facts in physical traces that I and others have been investigating myself now. This is starting my 16th year as a television producer and a writer and a documentary filmmaker, having worked on many other subjects dealing with science, medicine, and the environment over the last 16 years. But when you have walked the path that I have, and when you have heard what I have heard off the record concerning uh, military and intelligence contacts with a non-human intelligence, and when you get into a story as difficult and strange as the animal mutilation mystery that led to the abduction syndrome that involved circles in pastures and grass and does to date, and then you have the eyewitness testimony that links something that is described as non-human to crafts that can put beams down around animals and lift them into something in the sky in front of ranchers and people who have told me this in now half a dozen cases, but are terrified of human ridicule if they should come forward and address it publicly with the exception of one man named Dwayne Knight from Oregon, and I will show you a brief excerpt today from his statement concerning animals rising in beams of light. Stitched together, not any one aspect so far indisputably proves that we have extraterrestrials or other dimensionals or something that's unimaginable interacting with the planet. It doesn't definitively prove yet, and that seems to be what all the disinformation has been about over the last 50 years, is to make sure that no one could get their hands on the hard physical bodies and the hard craft to prove. But over the last 50 years, there have been nuggets and nuggets and pieces and pieces and clearly leaks and increasing leaks from people I know in the United States that are working, are actively working in either military or in intelligence, and they seem to be extremely frustrated themselves about carrying out policies that they now disagree with. And today, I'm going to do a formal program with slides and videos working through some of my most recent research of the last 12 to 14 months with Dr. John Altshuler, pathologist and hematologist in Denver, Colorado, a series of veterinarians in which we have been trying to get more and more academic and medical and professional help to look at these cases of high strangeness in the animal deaths, the crop circles, the link that we find between what happens to the plants underneath the animals' bodies and what we're finding in the plants that have been affected in at least four countries that we have studied, England, Australia, Canada, and the United States, we're finding similarities that appear to at least suggest that some sort of a complex energy is involved at these sites, even if we cannot show you what the precise technology is. And I think, finally, 
before I begin, I just want to emphasize that if there was one eyewitness to the murders of those two people that have now become known as the O.J. Simpson trial in the United States, the last year would have been very different. One eyewitness in a court of law can bring a conviction. We're now 50 years in counting since the stories of quote unquote flying saucers and the alleged crash of a flying saucer at Roswell Army Air Force Base or near there, specifically Corona, began emerging in newspaper files. And in those 50 years, we have seen this constant emergence of disinformation on one side, but increasing eyewitness testimony. And yet, as the eyewitness testimony has mounted, it has also taken on a strange position of being able to be ridiculed, and that humans, I think, are more afraid of their fellow humans than they are of almost anything else. And that is one of the big stumbling blocks is trying to now provide a space in which academics and the general public will feel comfortable in being able to be involved in what may be the greatest story not only of this century but of all centuries, and that is finally coming face to face with the fact that some kind of non-human intelligence has been interacting with our planet for a very long time. And as we begin now, I'm going to start with the part that I personally have been trying to stress in my work, which is physical evidence, hard physical evidence that we can pick up, that we can handle, that we can analyze, combined with the eyewitness testimony that I think we should give much more credence to. Now, if what you're looking at on the screen was a photograph taken one year ago on July 13, 1994. It is a 150-foot long formation found in a wheat field near Windsor, Ontario, Canada. The Canadian Broadcasting Company in Windsor produced a story about this mysterious formation, and I want to show you now a video excerpt from the Canadian broadcast. If we could see video number one. There's a large, unusual pattern in the wheat. Whoever did it did a really nice job. Come on, Daddy! <laughs> From the air, a very distinct pattern of carefully knocked down wheat is obvious. It's about 50 meters long at its widest point, with a straight line connecting a pair of double circles. It's similar to patterns found in England three years ago. Those crop circles were eventually proved to be a prank. Here, the jury's still out. Sure it wasn't a chopper? <laughs> no, it wouldn't be a chopper. UFO? Possibly. I think it's from up there somewhere. They're going to put up a sign there, aliens welcome. I think, like, people are just fooling around. So for the first time, there's a sense of festivity here in the wheat field as people debate the options. But there is one other unanswered question. How do you explain the dead rat? Smack in the middle of one of the smallest circles is a very dead rat. Police have no theories. No, nothing. At least 20 similar cases of circle patterns in crops have been found around the world and in Canada during the last 15 years. And as in this case as well, it's the precision and symmetry that causes the most mystery. And how in the darkness were they able to come up with a pattern that's pretty doggone precise? How, how could they do that in the dark? Which is I, the I don't laser understand. There are no answers here today, just plenty to think about. Kim Christie, CBC News, Essex County. Is the laser pointer. That's the end of that photo. I'm trying to get the technology worked out here, because I am going to need to show a laser pointer. Do I push this one? OK, now, now we got it worked out. OK, thanks. Now, that dead rat caught inside of one of the circles of the formation was reminiscent, and now we're going to see if we can make this go forward once. There, now. Was reminiscent of a porcupine found dead in the middle of another Canadian formation in July 1989. 
This porcupine was found in the middle of a wheat circle in Estevan, Saskatchewan, because it was covered with a dark, oily substance that also stained the ground. The farmer contacted the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and asked for analysis to see if the animal had been cooked or burned. The RCMP report stated there was no indication of burn, but offered no other explanation for the dark discoloration, adding more mystery to the porcupine's odd death in the middle of a wheat circle. That was July 1989. Three years later, on August 29, 1992, Farmer Joe Rennick of Milestone, Saskatchewan, found a circle in his wheat field with a dead porcupine flattened like a cartoon character right in the middle of it. The soil under the flattened porcupine in the wheat circle, and this is his quote, was hard as cement, like someone put it inside an oven and baked it, unquote, in contrast to the wet clay soil outside the circle. Scanning electron microscope images of wheat seeds found under the porcupine were found to be shrunken and shriveled, as you can see. Right here. The, the, this is a normal seed, and you can see how smooth these two are. These were seeds that were found underneath the area where the porcupine had been found. This was a classic case also of the farmer, the first thing he did was throw the porcupine away. Then he contacted people to come and look at the circle. People are very uncomfortable with these animals. I've run into that problem even with ranchers. They will call up somebody immediately to drag away a mutilated animal. Then they will call to say maybe that they had a mutilation on their ranch. In this case, we lost the opportunity to do any kind of analysis on that porcupine, but we do have an interesting story that suggests a pattern that we have found in several other areas, including four countries where there have been crop circle formations, and in some of the cases that I and Dr. Altshuler and others have been studying concerning mutilated animals found either in circles in pasture grass or near areas where there have been circles. One of those cases took place on June 21st, 1994, in Garnett, Kansas. What made this case especially interesting is that this wheat field that has this irregular uh, downed wheat area that had oval patterns to it was found not far from where a heifer was laying dead and mutilated, the second mutilation on the farm in two months, and the heifer was lying in a half circle of downed pasture grass. The owner, Dennis Claiborne, told me that prior to finding the heifer dead with the strange bloodless excisions, that he had been hearing the sounds of helicopters at night coming from the direction of this wheat field, but that he never saw anything, no structure, no lights, just the sounds of helicopters. I asked his wife, I talked with her about it. She said that she had heard the sounds of this helicopter too. They assumed that somebody was flying low over their wheat fields, but they could never see any lights. So when he and an investigator named Ray Jagoda, who was helping me to gather samples from the wheat field and from uh, the circle where the cow was lying, uh, went there, they both discussed the fact that maybe that there was helicopter downdraft that had produced these ovals in this wheat field and maybe had something to do with the mutilation of this heifer. Well, when Dr. Levengood, W.C. Levengood, a biophysicist in Michigan who has been working now on starting with crop circle formations five years ago and in the past 12 months has ended up helping us on samples that we have gathered from very unusual animal deaths in the United States, when he examined the plants collected from inside these ovals and from the grass half circle that the heifer was found lying in and compared them to normal plants collected from far outside the oval, he was amazed to see the severity of the changes in the growth nodes. We're now talking and looking at plants taken from the wheat in that oval. This is what normal wheat looks like. 
It grows vertically, <clears throat> extending from these growth nodes. And for those who may not be familiar, the best example I can give to make these photos a little more clear, and I'll go back to the one that is the reorientation that we have been founding now, finding now for five years, different countries in these formations. If you take a wheat plant, and this is the ground, and these are the seeds, there are growth nodes on wheat, for example, there are usually four, and they're numbered from, <coughs> excuse me, from Dr. Levengood's point of view, he goes one, two, three, four. The cells themselves, in terms of thickness and sturdiness, differ as you come up the plant. What he has found, and what you're looking at here, is a chronic change in the formation plants and what we have found underneath the animals in which this upper node is extended, this node is extended, reoriented, meaning the cells themselves have changed the direction of growth. And inside some of these, and we found them now in many cases, I need the six fingers of our Roswell friend. Here it is growing normally. This next may be clear. It's difficult when you see these plants, it's much clearer, but I'll go to the one that I think is the most obvious to you out there. This is what is now we're calling an expulsion. An expel, uh, it's a literal a hole that has burst out of the growth nodes that are lower. We found a consistent pattern as you come down toward the soil where the actual cellular tissue of the plant's growth node is thicker and firmer. These are not stretching and reorienting. These are literally exploding outward. Some of them have exploded so dramatically outward that all the internal tissue has literally burst out and there's a, a big hole in there. Looking at this, Dr. Levengood, he steps back and has said now that the one thing that he can say is that whatever is producing this reorientation in the growth nodes and especially these expulsions, it has to be heating the cell water in the growth nodes very rapidly and very intensely. And in the lower cells that are thicker, they ha the water has to burst out, whereas in the upper nodes that are thinner and more fragile, his hypothesis is that it is affecting an almost kind of uh, bending, but it's not leaving any crinks. I've seen hundreds, literally hundreds of these reoriented stems now in a variety of fields, and you literally are looking at a vertical stem, and then the entire growth node is extended, is reoriented without any bend or crack. And in some of the cases this summer, we're getting reorientations past 45 degrees, they are going into 60 degrees from the vertical. And as dramatic as that seems, and as implausible as it seems, I have walked long fields on control situations where I've been looking at normal plants saying, this cannot be, this, there must be some normal explanation for hundreds of uh, growing wheat, barley, whatever the crop, to be found in these conditions. They must be existing outside in the normal control field somewhere, and we just haven't found them. And to date, I and others have done long walks on normal, vertical, growing, healthy crops, and we cannot find any proliferation of this take a whole handful and all of the stems are reoriented as we're finding in the formations and have found under some of the uh, same kinds of changes under the animals. normal again. For decades, since at least the early 1970s, mutilated animals have been found inside circles in grass or pastures. A mutilated heifer was found in the middle of one of these circles in Minnesota in 1974. But in most cases, circles associated with animal mutilations kill the grass and plants, sometimes for as long as two years or more, a significant difference from the crop circle mystery in which the cereal crops continue to grow and are even harvested. One of the things to keep in mind, though, is that in the Canadian situation where they found the porcupine at the center of that downed wheat there, flattened as if some sort of an energy force had flattened the porcupine, 
the farmer talked about the cement character of the soil underneath where the circle was, but was dramatically impressed by the fact that his shoes were completely caked with wet mud immediately at the edge of the cement dry circle. That is more consistent with my files over the last 16 years of cases that we have studied concerning animal mutilations tied to circles in ground. Uh, I would say that the majority of those cases, the ground is found very, very hard and cement-like and caked. On February 24th this year at 9 o'clock in the morning, a one-year-old steer was found in a closed corral on the outskirts of Las Vegas, Nevada. This is about 20 or 30 minutes from downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. The rectum had been cored out in a clean, dry hole. The left ear had been removed in a serrated edge like pinking shears that you might take to cut cloth. Now, I'm not sure if this is clear to you. I have one more closer picture. This was taken by the veterinarian at the scene. Can you see that slightly serrated edge? I'm going to show you more on other animals here in a moment. We'll come to that in a second. This serrated edge is something that has been reported since the 70s in law enforcement files. I myself have dealt with cases. And what I'd like to do is to show you now a brief video excerpt from my latest documentary, Strange Harvest 1993, and some events in Alabama and their comparisons to some of the uh, historic files on these serrated edges uh, in previous years. If we could have videotape number two. cuts are serrated with a darkened edge like this one found on a steer in Oregon in 1990. This notched edge is similar to one from a 1975 mutilation in Montana. No pathology study was done back then, but in 1990, the Oregon State Diagnostic Laboratory concluded the notched edge does exhibit a heat-induced incision. It is not volume. possible to tell whether this lesion was volume. caused by a laser. More audio volume. Pathology studies also confirm that this serrated edge was cut with high heat. This is 1993 tissue from a male calf found in Crossville, Alabama, and examined by Fife, Alabama police officer Ted Oliphant. You can see the stepped and notched incision, almost like stairs with notches on them along the edge of this wound. Clearly, this could not have been done by coyotes. And I'll turn the tissue sample around so you can get another look at it. You can clearly see the stepped, notched incision on this tissue. OK, that's enough. Another on that screen. video, we can close. There have been many other cases with this strange serrated edge. Interestingly, some are found with evidence of high heat, and some are not. Now, we'll discuss that a little bit more, meaning that the excisions have been cut with something hot enough to literally cause laked hemoglobin and other changes in the collagen that could only be associated with high heat attached to the tissue. Now, in addition to the ear cut off with a serrated edge in this Las Vegas case, a veterinarian, Dr. Garth Lamb did an internal examination of the steer in the corral at approximately 9 o'clock in the morning, soon after the owners found the steer. And keep in mind, I've uh, met and talked with these people. I have been at this location. It is a very high-end, wealthy section of Las Vegas where people have uh, 10 or 12 or 15 acres. Many of them raise horses. They have the cattle to train the horses. This was a large house. It had a fenced corral behind the house, and the entire property is completely lined with high painted, very, very well made white fences. It is a completely and totally enclosed property. And in the evening before February 24th, the steer was fine. The entire uh, event took place approximately 300 feet 
from the back door of their house. But the, none of their dogs dark, their, their, uh, none of the dogs uh, barked. There was nothing that night that led them to even have any hint that something dramatic was happening in the corral outside the home until they got up in the morning and found the steer. Now what I'd like to show you is a very puzzled veterinarian who's being caught on videotape uh, for real as he examines this steer. And as the video begins, you will hear him uh, trying to say, you did say this is a steer, isn't isn't it because he can find no penile tissue. Let's have the next video. And don't worry, it is not, uh, it is not gross. I've taken those parts out mostly. This is Dr. Lamb. The steer was found right here at that site near the watering tank. There is the cord out rectum. We are looking at a steer here, aren't we? I think we need more volume. He's trying to find any penile tissue. Do you guys get a picture of this? It's close up? Yeah. We got the video of it now. Well, that's tough to me, for me to explain, George. There's no root of the penis coming down through. This is a natural orifice here. It should be. We should have an opening. And he's obviously been castrated. Mm -hmm. Is that a cut or a burn? Or how well, do you take that off? I don't, I don't know how you would take... I mean, where's the rest of this thing even at? We're not talking uh, the navel now. We're... Well, no, this is where you urinate from. Because I, I'm thinking, how many heifers and how many screws did we have on this on the back piece? I mean, this one had a sex change. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they crossed the rest, but I didn't think it come down to the cattle. I mean, it wouldn't have been a heifer. Well, it doesn't appear to be. That's what I'm saying. They passed the remnant of the scroll of sack there. Yeah. This is where, they, where the penis would be coming down at. Okay, How and can the technicians up there maybe increase the volume on the videos? I, it seems like it's low. Now, not only was Dr. Lamb puzzled by the fact that he could not find any penile tissue in an animal that, according to the owners, was alive and well the night before and was a steer and should have had in some kind of an opening going into the belly, and as he told me when he got there, it was as if the tissue and the belly of the animal was literally and totally sealed. And he had to cut it open to do the necropsy looking for the penile tissue. This, uh, you will hear, is, has relevant to several cases that we studied last year in which penile tissue was also missing in the abdomen of male animals without an excision on the surface. But in addition to this puzzle, Dr. Lamb, could not understand what could have caused the death of this animal if it was alive and well the night before and appeared healthy upon his necropsy examination in the corral, what could have killed it? So he asked the owners if he could sever the head, because it's easier to transport a head than the body, back to his office to take an x-ray of the head to see if he could find any evidence of a metal projectile, bullet or otherwise, that may have gone into the brain, suddenly killing the animal. When he x-rayed, he was stunned again to find that there was a 1.5 by, I believe, 2.5 inch, I'm talking in inches, 
section of skull bo bone had been removed back here, had a very smooth jello-like surface to the cut, and he put a penny out here to show what mat metal would have looked like in an x-ray if he had found it. There are intense areas sometimes in bone that probably uh, would, uh, you'd say that the intensity was similar, but in terms of looking for an object that should have showed up on x-ray that would be an anomalous projectile, he could not find any, and then he found this excision of skull bone. Not knowing what instrument removed the section of skull bone so smoothly, Dr. Lamb and Dr. Altshuler sent the skull, or a section of this skull, to an MRI, which is magnetic resonance uh, specialist in California for examination. The specialist who at this point prefers not to be identified used magnetic resonance imaging to examine the bone. The goal was to search for metal fragments which might have remained as residue from an instrument such as a bone saw, which is right now from every veterinarian that we've talked to is the only way they know that you could excise a reasonably sized chunk of skull bone from a, a cow. However, the specialist found no metal filings and the mode of excision of this section of bone from this animal remains a mystery to date. And I think for those of you thinking back to where the ear was removed, it was above and to the forward front of the head, whereas the excision of the skull bone itself was toward the back of the uh, skull. So it, even though there was a hole there, uh, and we've all talked about it, maybe there was some way to go into the, the place where the ear had been excised and somehow get something in there. The veterinarians have said, but the angle on which you would have to go to get out a segment, a complete segment of the skull bone, and then leave a smooth glassy surface, which is what they all agreed was there, was not like any instrument that they knew that they had cut the bone with because bone saws leave a very familiar uh, sort of surface striation. Dr. John Altshuler also examined tissue sampled from the ear and the rectum of the Nevada steer. And in this case, he did not find any evidence of heat at the excision lines. Uh, but he did conclude that the cuts had definitely been made with some kind of a sharp instrument. This was not a case of predation. And in Chacon, New Mexico, about 30 miles from Eagle's Nest, which is in the northern, uh, central, and the slightly northeastern section of New Mexico, an unidentified flying object was seen the weekend of September 10th. Chacon is very rural, has only a few hundred farm residents who depend on each other to survive. They watch their pastures, the mountains, and the sky for any signs of trouble and report it to each other. Around September 11th, a couple of people reported seeing an object moving in the night sky that, and this was the quote, I talked with the postmistress in that tiny little town. She said they came in and said, last night we saw something that looked like a house with lighted windows flying low over the house toward pastures. Chacon is at the base of mountain canyons that rise to about nine to 10,000 foot peaks up in here. This is like one of, when they talk about a canyon, don't think of a rocky canyon. These are, in that part of the country, these are canyons. And this one known as Luhan goes up to 9,500 feet. I've been to the top to see a mutilated calf and an elk up there. On September 13, 1994, at the base of Luhan Canyon, two days after the UFO sighting, a cow was found dead and mutilated. Its tongue had been removed deep within the throat, down to the larynx, according to the veterinarian who looked at it. And a neat circle of hide had been removed around the front jaws. The rectal and vaginal tissue had been removed in a neat circular cut that was dry and bloodless. A carpenter, named Larry Gardia, found this dead cow on his way toward Luhan Canyon to go bear hunting at four o'clock in the afternoon on September 13th. He had a 30-06 rifle with him as he came to a chain link fence that he was going to have to go through a gate 
to get on the other side of the private property on which he was working to remodel a house and to go on up Luhan Canyon. This entire area is used as pasture for cows in a kind of scrub oak situation where there are a lot of trees and grass and then open areas. In this, I'm now going to play for you a sec uh, segment of an interview that I did with him last September, about a month ago, of what it was that he heard and saw when he came to this chain link fence and saw this animal. I hope this is going to work on here. And when I came up on that cow, it's when I saw it laying behind that hole, and it kind of freaked me out. And I was just looking at it, and all of a sudden, I heard that noise. Are you and getting Are like you getting any well. volume on there? Stop. I I'm going to stop for a second because I'm having a hard time telling whether there's is there volume out there at at the far end. Is it enough? Okay. Uh, yeah, is there any way of uh, uh, lifting this volume up? Testing, one, two, three. If there is, we'll, we'll try it again. Is this well. one on? And that's what the first thing that came into my mind in those few seconds, yeah. you know, it just came better? into my mind. About I'm going to start. I, I think that's, this is, I think what I have to do is me. We'll get this worked out. We'll persist as we have to do in this entire phenomenon. And when I came upon that cow, it's when I saw it laying, and it had that hole, and it kind of freaked me out. And I was just looking at it, and all of a sudden, I heard that noise. But it sounds like a narc weld sound. It goes or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it, it, to me, it sounded like a narc weld. And that's what the first thing that it came into my mind in those few seconds, you know, it just came into my mind about that noise. And all at the same time, everything like happened so quick, you know, I mean, when I heard that noise, and all of a sudden I heard the cows that I had passed when I was coming up the canyon, I had passed those cows, there's quite a few cows. And I looked back because I heard the running of the, the, the steps. And I turned around and I saw them all running the opposite direction. So when I turned, in those few seconds I turned back to look at the, to hear, you know, or to look toward the, where that sound was coming from. And as soon as I saw that, I see this cow that was on the other side of the fence. And when I saw it being pulled, it was on, on the other side of the fence, but it was being pulled right through the top of the brush or right through, like, through the brush. And I would see the cow at a good maybe 50 feet being dragged and then making a, uh, oh, a, it wasn't like, it was like a, an animal that was being tortured or, and It was like an animal being tortured? Yeah, it sounded like, uh, like if it was being hurt or, or if it was hurt or, like it was being tortured or something. Bellering. Yeah. And now, to get this... And I realized, talk about uh, lack of communication here. I thought this was some sort of a microphone up here. And in fact, this is the light. So it just shows that even for those of us who come from uh, television and film, uh, <laughs> it dawned on me, this is not a microphone. <laughs> Poor humble humans that we are. Okay, at that point, and thanks to Graham and everybody, they've really done good facilities. It's, it's my uh, incompetence up here. Uh, at this point, the, um, what is happening, and see now if I can show you and keep the slides going. He's now showing me, here was the mutilation site, and the head of the cow was here that you just saw the photographs of. There was another animal that 
he saw that was collapsed on its knees. Uh, this, these are reversed here today. Uh, the, here, back in here, there was another uh, second cow down on all four knees, unmoving. He did not know if it was dead or alive. This is the fence that he was going to walk down. It was a very small area of chicken wire in between the chain link fence on this property that was owned by an East Coast psychiatrist and his wife. A uh, very beautiful property and very heavily chain linked uh, border. It is at this area, the cows are running this way back into the open pasture. This is the other side where the cow is. This is where he saw the cow coming literally out of the air down on the other side and moving in a path coming up to here with its back going toward whatever this sound was. And when it got to here, I was standing there and I said, uh, what happened, Larry, when the cow got here? Did the back go down in the ditch and come back up and keep going? And he s said no. And I waited for him to explain to me if the cow didn't go down into the ditch, what happened? And he looked down at his shoes like he was embarrassed. And I said, well, how did the cow get from here to here? And he said, I guess it floated. And people don't want to utter these statements. I've encountered this many times. They have a hard time even with what they saw with their own eyes. When we discuss it in detail, he said the back of the cow just moved very smoothly, not, never went down to this side, and continued on up into an area where there was an abandoned cabin on one side and an outhouse on the other. He knew and could see those markers. The cow was going right up around and disappeared right in here. While it was approximately here, he said for reasons he doesn't know to this day, he raised his 30 6 and he shot at where he thought the sound was coming from, somewhere right here at treetop level. Then his mind as a hunter, uh, he re recalculated, refined his aim, and he went up here in the sky. He said when he shot up here, everything was silent. And for the first time, he felt terrified because now he had somebody's attention. And he was very afraid of what would happen to him. So he turned around, ran 15 minutes back to the house where he was working on uh, the carpentry, called the sheriff, called the owner of these cows, who was uh, a man uh, about a half a mile away who was pasturing in this ranch. and. He ran back, it took him about 30 to 40 minutes, and when he got back to the scene, the, the, uh, the cow with the excisions was still there, but the cow that had been on its knees at the log was missing, and the sheriff and the deputies and the owner and other ranchers fanned out into Luhan Canyon, and they searched for two and a half hours and they never found the cow that had been uh, moving on its side with its back toward whatever this odd sound was. And I talked with the owner who said that, uh, that in fact, on September 13th, two of his cows disappeared from that pasture and uh, were never returned, they were never found. Um, and this remains one of those high strangeness cases that is important because when we examine the grass from underneath the head, the belly, the rectal area, and along that path, I took many samples. Dr. Levengood even called me and said, uh, I have um, very consistent changes at what he describes as the mitochondria level in the cells where respiration in cell activity and metabolism takes place that he's been finding in the crop circle formations. And in this particular story, the highest change was at the location three feet in front of the gate where the, he had seen the cow coming down out of the air onto that path, which may mean that there was more energy being applied by some technology that was in the process of lifting the weight of that cow and putting it down. We don't know. That's purely speculative. But it was interesting that it was that spot that he found uh, the greatest uh, changes at the cell level. The second to greatest change was where the head was in the mutilated animal.
other strange mutilations, uh, this past year, about the same time, this was now in October, a month later, have included three mutilated cows in La Vida, New Mexico, in a pasture that is so remote that you have to get in a four-wheel drive to get to these areas. Here was the cow three weeks after, one of the three, three weeks later. And I put this in here because the tissue that's exuding from the rectal area is, um, is only after autolysis had set in, but I wanted you to see how clear there has been uh, no predation on this animal. Uh, even the calf, all of them were pregnant cows. The calf in this one was clearly defined in a belly that was beginning to sag with autolysis. And there was one of the highest count bear seasons last fall in Colorado. There were bear everywhere, coyotes everywhere. Um, I watched a coyote pace 20 feet from a dead steer on another New Mexico ranch. As the rancher and I walked up to look at the steer, the coyote clearly wanted to go to the body, but it was as if the, the coyote paced as if there was an invisible wall approximately 20 feet from the body of that steer in another one of the ranches around here. This animal, uh, I was getting to take photographs two weeks after uh, it, it had been found, and it was completely and totally untouched by predation. This same ranch where the four, there were four animals found dead, one is a puzzle, the other three were clearly animal mutilations. There were rings. Five rings were found essentially in a straight line running approximately a quarter of a mile through this pasture. And on the morning that I was there on November 14th, a sixth ring, a new ring, was found in the pasture. And whatever that means, uh, I don't know. They didn't have a mutilation associated with it, but I did collect uh, grass samples from the pasture from the new ring and from two of the other older rings. Here is another picture showing know the direction and how rugged this country is. Dr. Levengood found exactly the same patterns of mitochondria cell changes as he has found in pasture grass from the Garnet, Kansas case, from the Slavita case, from the case where the sound uh, beam was associated with the animal that was moving, and other cases, including the formations in cereal crops. Now, Within a very short period of all this activity in northern Mexico, of which there were many, many other cases, one rancher over an 18-month period lost 15 animals. In Colorado, east of Colorado Springs, in a very remote area called Kiowa, two buffalo in two weeks in a very sternly locked metal corral were also found. And in this one, we had a vet examine both of them. We had tissue analysis done. In both of them, the tongue was removed to the larynx in a smooth vertical cut upon veterinarian examination and noted in the necropsy report as being unusual. The ear was cut off in the first one, or the tongue was removed here. The ear was cut off in the first one with what appeared to be a sharp instrument, instrument of some kind that was not disputed. In the second buffalo, the ears were intact. The genitals in both of them had this identical extreme large excision of uh, circular excision of hide in the belly, but the lumen tissue, which is a thin tissue that covers the musculature, was untouched in both of the buffaloes. It was a large oval cut only hide deep. You can see here there's no uh, external excision into the belly, but the, and the rectum was cored out. But when a veterinarian, uh, this is the veterinarian in the second case, the vet in the first case found the identical uh, situation. All the penile tissue had been removed to within four inches of the urethra, in this case, uh, testicles had been uh, removed uh, along with the penile tissue. Everything had been removed from the external abdomen and in, into the belly except for four inches. Now the, the uh, interesting thing here is, is that we were able to get at least fresh enough tissue from the first buffalo and get it to the Colorado Veterinary Diagnostic Lab in Denver to see if we could discover anything. They found the tissue so hard 
that they could not sample it for microscopic examination. This is something we have continually found in the mutilations. We're at the scene. The mutilator's edge is so hard it feels like plastic, whereas the normal hide that you would cut would be pliable. And in this case, because the diagnostic lab said they could not process the specimen, Dr. Altshuler sent it to a yet another lab, told them the problem, and asked them if they could try a very special procedure for the softening of tissue to make slide preparations. Uh, they accomplished this, and under a microscope, it showed that there was late hemoglobin and collagen changes that, from uh, Dr. Altshuler's point of view as a pathologist of 29-some years, uh, that heat had been applied to the excision of this penis from inside the abdomen of at least one of these two buffaloes. And finally, having seen just a brief selection of pattern of some of the classic unusual animal deaths that uh, I and others have been studying, I would like to share an overview of what predators actually do to animals so that you can see a contrast for yourself. These photographs are from a booklet prepared by wildlife specialists from Texas A&M and Utah State University. I'm giving a copy of the entire publication to the president of the Colorado Sheriff's Association and others so that they can use it for references. And so far, I've had some feedback where the sher one sheriff deputy said to me, you know, I've known for 20 years that we weren't dealing with predator, but that was the only explanation that we could give. Now, what I'm going to show you is from the animal experts that have assembled these photographs in order to educate other wildlife animal specialists. In the first one, you hear a lot about the precise excisions of predatory birds. Here is what a hawk did to a lamb. Clearly, it is very bloody, and none of the classic areas of animal mutilation, such as the ear, eye, tongue, genitals, or rectum, were taken. Here is another lamb attacked and eaten by a bobcat. I think you would all agree that there is no similarity in these two photographs that I've just shown you to what I have laid out from the cases we've been studying. Here's an example of the teeth marks left by a bobcat in another attack, this time on the jaw of a lamb. And here are teeth marks from coyotes that attacked an angora sheep. Uh, I have seen dozens of mutilated animals and literally maybe now 600 photographs, 700 photographs, that I have in my files of mutilations, and there is not one that has any uh, teeth marks in the unusual animal deaths that uh, I have just described. After a coyote got through gnawing this sheep's head, there was nothing left but this very bloody mass, not the clean, bloodless excisions of an ear, eye, tongue, and jaw flesh that is typical of mysterious animal mutilations. Many times, veterinarians and others have said that the cord out rectums were the work of foxes or other predators. Here is what coyotes did do to the rectal area of a calf. Here is what coyotes did to the rectal area of a goat. And here is what dogs did to the back of a lamb. And finally, here is what was left of a fawn after coyotes attacked and ate it. And what I'd like to do now before I segue uh, into another, uh, what I think is possibly important area and germane to considerations uh, on these discussions of crash retrievals and disks, I'd like to give you another overview that goes back to the 70s upward, um, or actually 67 upward, of classic unusual animal deaths referred to by sheriffs and law enforcement and others as animal mutilations. If we could have the next video excerpt, please. Cuts and tissues taken have been similar from animal to animal and worldwide. Often one ear is taken, one eye is removed, along with a circular excision of flesh around the empty eye socket. The tongue is removed from deep within the throat. Udders are removed bloodlessly and often only hide deep. Or only the teats are removed in clean, dry holes 
or cut off at the surface of the udder. In males, the genitals are excised in a bloodless oval. The rectum is cored out in most of the animals, and sometimes the tail is also removed in a smooth cut through the tailbone. In a few cases, skull bone has been smoothly excised without evidence of bone saw marks. Veterinarians have also discovered internal organs oh, surgically removed, such as the trachea and esophagus in this Nebraska cow. Other reported missing internal organs have included the heart, lungs, bladder, uterus, vagina, and penis. Stories about strange animal deaths began in the 1960s. In September 1967, the story went worldwide when an Appaloosa mare in the San Luis Valley of Southern Colorado was found dead and stripped of flesh from the neck up. All the internal chest organs had been surgically removed and under a microscope, the hemoglobin was cooked, implying high heat had been used to cut the tissue. Strange lights had been seen then also, and residents wondered if UFOs had something to do with the horse's unusual death. Okay, we can stop that video there. It's possible that what's happening in these highly strange animal deaths relates to what a rancher saw in Sand Springs, Oregon, east of Bend in the late 1980s. And I want to show you this brief excerpt from the one person who has been willing to at least go on the record in terms of an audio excerpt, not video, uh, so that you can hear in his own words his experience. If we could have the next video, please. I interviewed Oregon resident Dwayne Wright, who met one rancher who described seeing glowing round discs pick up cattle. As this audio tape begins, Mr. Wright talks about standing next to a dead and mutilated cow at Sand Springs, southeast of Bend, Oregon, in the early 1980s. The animal was pressed into the ground as if it had fallen from considerable height. The elderly ranch hand, who has since passed away, told Dwayne Wright what he had seen and heard. Mr. Wright is speaking on the audio tape. And he said they, they came at night, the cattle were just drawn up, they floated right up off the ground. He'd, he'd seen it happen, and he said that sometime later they just dropped them back when they were done with whatever. Uh, they were dropped back down either under the desert or through the trees into the forest. And he said you could hear him at night making horrendous crash through the trees. Okay, we can end that video. Perhaps the government of the United States at some military and intelligence level has long known that an alien life form is responsible for the highly strange cases of these bloodless, trackless animal mutilations. And let's take this uh, white-tailed fawn carcass off the screen. Let's go to a blank. <laughs> okay. Perhaps there is even government knowledge about the motive which might involve the creation of a hybrid species that Bud Hopkins hypothesizes that is part human and part something else. And they are no doubt afraid of public panic and outrage if that fact were known. Perhaps that is why on April 9, 1983, 12 years ago at Kirtland Air Force Base, Air Force Office of Special Investigations Agent Richard C. Doty said to me, quote, that documentary you did, A Strange Harvest, upset some people in Washington. They don't want animal mutilations and UFOs connected together in the public's mind. AFOSI Special Agent Doty also showed me an alleged briefing paper for the President of the United States about crash disks and alien body retrievals. In that list in the first paragraph, there were at least a dozen including three different crashes referenced there in and around Roswell. Ma um, Magdalena was, uh, was mentioned specifically. Uh, Socorro, or not Socorro, but Aztec. Uh, there were several lists of places uh, that would suggest that there were many different kinds of craft, or many craft and many bodies, not knowing any details. Since that conversation 12 years ago, many other military and intelligence people have communicated with me, almost as an underground within our government, all saying an extraterrestrial presence is real and that the situation is more complex 
than any human mind is capable of understanding or ready to accept. Always, when you are getting what are called background leaks from anyone that claims to be working for the government or military, you always have the, the problem and of ferreting out what is disinformation and what is not. Trying to avoid public panic is the most common reason they have given for why there has been a 50-year-long cover-up since the 1940s, a government cover-up that continues to insist there are no extraterrestrials and that UFO sightings are hoaxes or hallucinations or misidentifications of birds, stars, and planets. Some sources say it's a semantics game, that the word extraterrestrial can be rejected because the intruding intelligence is not from off-planet, but from underground on our own Earth. If something has lived here underground long before the appearance of Homo sapiens sapien, then technically that hypothetical underground intelligence would not be extraterrestrial. There is also a possible semantics game around other dimensional existences at play that are not strictly biological or even from inside this universe. Perhaps all are interacting here, biological extraterrestrials, underground Earth inhabitants that are not human, and other dimensional intelligences from different frequencies in the cosmos. Whatever the sources of the mysterious phenomena are, this past year I and other researchers have been receiving a similar pattern of off-the-record information from sources who will not identify themselves. Usually I do not report information unless it is first-hand eyewitness testimony or hard physical facts that I've been able to research and corroborate. However, with the television broadcasts in England and the United States last uh, week of the controversial autopsy footage of alleged extra extraterrestrial humanoids, about which the United States government so far has not made official comment, I think it's fair to let you consider one perspective that has been circulating about the non-human issue from sources who claim to work now, not in the past, but now for highly classified U.S. projects related to non-human entities. The excerpts of one such communication I'm about to read are from a floppy disk delivered to me a year ago after the release of my newest book, Glimpses of Other Realities. I and others have also received other such communications from alleged insiders with similar content, which suggests two or more different non-human intelligences interact are interacting with our planet for entirely different reasons. The suggestion that several different non-human entities have been involved with our Earth is also relevant where, while pondering the confusion surrounding the strange humanoids in the alleged autopsy footage that Graham just went through, I think, a very fine uh, outline of why uh, disinformation can surround suddenly a story and put the public and the media completely uh, at bay from uh, what might be real actual footage buried in the surrounding disinformation, which buys the governments more time to keep this story buried. I don't know that for a fact, but I'm suggesting that's one thing to keep in mind, uh, just as Graham was ending. The suggestion that several different non-human entities have been involved with our planet whether Roswell, Socorro, Magdalena, Aztec, Northern Mexico, Europe, or wherever. They do involve leaks about crash disks and alien bodies, both dead and alive, and these leaks have been emerging for decades, not just the last two years. The public deserves honest information from government employees that are, in fact, paid with taxpayer dollars. Lacking the official truth about the situation, we are left with unofficial statements like the following. One of the leaks that came to me on a floppy disk uh, one year, well, more than one year ago in June of 94. Quote, the contact with the non-human entities has occurred and will continue to occur regardless of our understanding of the mechanism of the contact. Our misguided program directors, they seem to be at odds with whoever they work with, our misguided program directors cling to the false belief that we can control or manipulate the NHEs when in actuality the reverse is occurring. We are the ones being manipulated and deceived. 
Cellular changes in plants from within genuine crop circle formations are due to the same sort of energy release exposure as that used in the so-called negative healing experimentation that has never been defined. I and others do not know what they are referring to. Once again, forces being utilized by NHEs to interact with us in a bizarre, confusing manner designed to divert us and draw our attention from the true purpose of their actions, manipulation, and deception. The penultimate diversion in this whole area is the mutilation of thousands of animals. The NHEs with the ability to work on scene invisibly and to create incisions and excised tissue in manners which seem humanly impossible because they are, and to either remain totally undetected or to create the illusion of extraterrestrial beings such as the apparent UFO phantom helicopter sightings and occupant sightings often associated with these events, all provide an extremely effective smoke screen. People are now busy chasing secret government projects, satanic cults, and UFOs, while the actual perpetrating agents go unsuspected. Regarding the phantom helicopters, while many are direct NHE productions, i.e. craft, that is not an appropriate term as they do not need to travel via a propulsive device, and the implication here is that the Helicopters are some sort of camouflage or an illusion created so that whatever this intelligence is, that it can move among us and, and around us and be perceived as something we identify as terrestrial. There are, however, many of these helicopters related to our own program, especially regarding running checks and surveillance on mutilation sites and so-called abduction victims. The comment left on your telephone answering machine referenced on page 194 of your book, Glimpses of Other Realities, and that is referring to um, a message on my answering machine that was left there uh, right after I had produced UFO report sightings for Fox and Paramount, and uh, I was out of town when the uh, premiere was on in the United States, and when I got back, there was this uh, strange message that re referred to some of the material we had put in the United States program and basically said that what we were dealing with was not hundreds of years in advance, but was thousands or millions of years in advance, um, that they, uh, the voice said that as far as they were concerned, no harm was intended to humanity, but that the real purpose for their being here was something that humanity in its current um, mental uh, and social uh, state could not handle. These readers say, or these writers say, the comment left on your telephone answering machine may very well have been made by someone within the government hierarchy who has been convincingly fed the false ET scenario propagated as disinformation by those who are in charge of the NHE projects. Many variations of this exist, and all who are privy to a particular variation are convinced that they have the answer. With our society as it is now, the core truth of the situation is such that the public really could not handle it. The ultimate diversionary tactic up to this point is the UFO abduction scenario. The concept that these events are the result of extraterrestrial beings is a masterful piece of disinformation to divert attention away from the real source of the NHEs. Our information as to the true nature of these events does not negate the possibility of extraterrestrial life but the causal source of the UFO and UFO abduction phenomena is not extraterrestrial. The so-called Roswell crash of 1947 did indeed occur, and debris of a non-earthly type was found as were non-human bodies. Although in our position we cannot speak with authority, we believe that there is a basis in truth for Bob Lazar's story of government-held craft. However, the origin is not extraterrestrial. The NHEs being dealt with in our psi weapons development and who are apparently allowing themselves to be used for a time are neither benevolent nor neutral. It was our feeling that very few could understand or accept this. Your comments and thoughts and glimpses of other realities concerning ancient civilizations and their contacts with the NHEs need to be considered in light of the bigger picture of the deception of mankind as a whole. If this grand deception is taking the course it seems to be, then it makes complete sense to analyze the false gods of ancient civilizations in light of the current level of deception. It is only logical that given their non-human, other-dimensional nature, 
the NHEs would be able to foresee the need to establish a foundation base, the facts of which could be twisted or distorted by the fog of antiquity and forgotten cultural distinctives to seemingly establish themselves as the bringers of all good things to humanity. Explore Jacques Vallée's passport to Magonia again for more close parallels between the fairy manifestation of the NHEs and current events. And look very closely at messengers of deception. Dr. Vallée was so close to the truth of the situation with the exception that the ultimate manipulators are not human. These communicators have followed up with other information to me since that one, suggesting that we're dealing with at least some aspect that is other dimensional. If any and all parts of this confusing quicksand in a hall of mirrors is leading us anywhere, it is at least to one, I think, bottom line, and that is we're not alone in the universe. We are, for some reason, a decision has been made that whatever government knowledge is about the bodies at Roswell, bodies at Socorro, bodies at Magdalena, bodies wherever they are, and the technology, that in 1995, that the story is still not to be made clear to the human family. That, I think, is the major question all of us should be asking. Regardless of what the leaks say, and they swing from everything from transformational to this suggesting that there is a problem with something, whatever the leaks are, there is the fundamental aspect of everything that all of us here are driving toward, and that is, what is the truth about contact with something that appears to be non-human, regardless of where it comes from, and what does it want, and why do physical traces seem to swing from the very beautiful crop formations, possibly, to the repulsive animal mutilations, to the very uh, strange and sometimes terrifying human abductions. We are moving, it seems, toward maybe the pressure of, of the public asking the governments to level with us on crash retrievals. But even then, regardless of what is shown to us on television, it may be only the tip, the very tiny tip of an iceberg, and I'm here today trying to just share with you some of the complex and larger uh, possibilities in which to look at what the Santilli story, where it evolves, and there may be more uh, film that will be released, and we still are left with where is the truth in all of this, and why have governments chosen policies of silence? And uh, I thank you for being here in Leeds.